On the morning of April 16th, 2014, a South Korean ferry known as MV Suwol was en route from Incheon towards Jeju. However, just before 9 o'clock Korean Standard Time, the vessel would send a distress signal, and before rescue could arrive, the ship would capsize and sink, taking with her 306 occupants of the total 476 on board. The deaths included 250 students from Danwon High School. But interestingly enough, people immediately noticed that most of the crew, as well as the captain, had survived and seemingly gotten off the stricken vessel before anyone else did. Hello, hello, welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and my underwater train finders. You were the reason why this content remains a coward! A horrific coward! You big, fat, stinking coward! And today, we are going to discuss a terrible disaster that caused the deaths of many children. It's a pretty heavy topic. But I think it's important, especially given it involves a terrible, terrible ship captain. This is the story of the sinking of the MV Suwol. MV Suwol was a Ropax ferry that was built by the Japanese company Hayashikane Shipbuilding and Engineering back in 1994. She was 146 meters in length, 479 feet, and 22 meters, 72 feet wide. She could carry a total of 921 passengers, but if you included the crew, that would be a total of 956 people. She also had a legal capacity for 180 vehicles, as well as 154 regular cargo containers. She could travel up to 22 knots, and her range was roughly 264 miles, 425 kilometers. Suwol was not her original name. When she was first built, she was known as Ferry Namanao, and she operated in Japan for about 18 years without any incident. She had a fantastic record and ran quite well. However, in 2012, she was purchased for $11.3 million by the Chonghijin Marine Company a South Korean shipping company that was controlled by the family of businessman Yu byung yeon That's when she was renamed Suwol, and she was refurbished, given modifications that included adding extra passenger cabins in the third, fourth, and fifth decks, which raised her passenger capacity by 117, and increasing her weight by 239 tons. She did receive regulatory and safety checks within the confines of South Korean law by the Korean Register of Shipping, and upon passing those, she began her operations in South Korea on the 15th of March, 2013. She made three round trips every week from Incheon to Jeju. In February of 2014, it was reported that she again passed a vessel safety inspection by the South Korean Coast Guard following an intermediate survey to ensure she remained in a general condition which satisfied the requirements set by the Korean Register of Shipping. Some articles claim that some of the modifications given to her were illegal, but according to the Korean Register of Shipping, she did actually meet all their requirements at the time. That included the blueprint inspections, stability tests, and shipboard inclination tests, though it is worth mentioning that the modifications resulted in her center of gravity being moved upward by about half a meter, one foot eight inches, and they caused a left-right imbalance. But this wasn't considered enough of a problem to worry the register of shipping in South Korea, so she still passed. In the process of approving the modifications, the Korean Register of Shipping, KR, reduced the maximum amount of cargo that could actually be carried by her from 1,450 tons to just 987 tons and increased the amount of ballast she needed to 1,703 tons. 
the cargo limits were actually not known by the Korea Shipping Association, which had the responsibility to actually manage the ferries, or the Korea Coast Guard, the KCG, which were responsible for overseeing the Shipping Association. So basically, everyone who needed to know about these changes didn't actually know. And the Board of Audit and Inspection later showed that the KR's licensing was actually based on falsified documents. After the inspections were completed, they also added 37 tons of marble to the gallery room at the bridge deck located on the back of the ship. But most of this was unknown to the vast majority of people at the time, and even the ones that did know probably didn't see it as a big deal. So she began her operations either way. And that brings us to the 15th of April, 2014. She was actually scheduled to leave port at Incheon at 6.30 p.m., but a fog, which restricted visibility to less than a single kilometer, led the Incheon Vessel Traffic Service, the VTS, to issue a low visibility warning around 5.30 p.m., and that caused the Shipping Association to hold Sewol's departure, since they felt that the low visibility would make it too dangerous. The VTS would later retract the warning after the weather improved around 8.35 p.m., and the Shipping Association removed the restriction on Sewol's departure after double-checking the weather conditions and consulting with the KCG. She wound up departing around 9 p.m., and was actually the only ship to leave port that evening. She was carrying 443 passengers at the time, 33 crew members, and a total of 2,142.7 tons of cargo that included 185 cars. Among those passengers were 325 students who were on a field trip from Danwon High School. The captain on duty was 69-year-old Captain Lee Jun Sok who had actually been brought in as a replacement for the regular captain. He wasn't originally supposed to be on duty, but he did have over 40 years of experience at sea and had traveled the route before, so there shouldn't have been any issues. He had been hired on a one-year contract with a monthly salary of around $2,500. Also among the 33 crew members of the journey, 19 were irregular part-time workers. There were also many problems with the Sewol when she left. Some of you may have already noticed that I mentioned that at the time she was carrying 2,142.7 tons of cargo, even though I said her maximum allowance was 987 tons of cargo. So basically she was taking way more cargo than she was ever supposed to, and that cargo was apparently improperly secured. On top of that, only 761.2 tons of ballast were actually taken, and her ballast tanks were not being properly maintained. The regular captain of Seoul, Captain Shin, had actually told Chong Heejin about the decrease in stability, and he would later claim that the company threatened to fire him if he continued his objections. His warnings were also sent through an official working for the Ichion Port Authority on the 9th of April 2014, to which an official from Chong Heejin responded that he would personally deal with anyone making the claims. Oh. Oh, good. I see you're taking this real seriously, guys. Shin also wanted a repair job for a malfunctioning steering gear on the 1st of April 2014, but that wasn't done, because April Fools, I guess. And the KR had noted that in a stability test report dated for the 24th of January 2014, that Seoul had become too heavy and less stable after the modifications were made. So, really, she shouldn't have been sailing at all is what I'm trying to say. Also, and I feel this is very important and I really need to stress this, Chung Heejin did have a budget for safety training of the crew on board the ship. It was two US dollars. This is not a typo. This is not a mistake. Two US dollars. Do you know what they used it for? To buy a paper certificate that simply said that there was safety training. There was no actual safety training. This is ridiculous. And it's about to get a bunch of children killed. On the 16th of April, at 7.30 a.m., the third mate, Park Han Kyul, and helmsman, Cho Jun Ki, took over the watch from the previous team. At that time, Sewol was heading at a course of roughly 165 degrees 
at a speed of about 20 knots, and was operating two different radar devices at 8.20 a.m., when she was about 3 to 5 kilometers from entering the Mangal Channel, Park ordered Cho to change the steering system from autopilot to manual. When Sewol arrived at the channel at 8.27 a.m., at a course of 137 degrees, the wind speed was actually at about 4 to 7 meters per second, and wave heights around a half a meter. But the visibility was very good, the Mengel Channel is already known for having very strong currents, so when steering a ship through it, the helmsman must use notable caution. But the conditions were pretty calm, and Sewol was following a route that was frequently used. There was nothing out of the ordinary and nothing that the crew had to be overly concerned about at the time. Wider areas of the channel did contain things like rocks and shallow waters, but those spots weren't in the ship's path. Some news articles paint Park as being inexperienced based on her unfamiliarity with the channel, but that isn't true. Park had actually passed through it on multiple occasions, so she should have been fine. While all this was going on, breakfast was being served in the cafeteria. CCTV showed that the students were socializing on the deck. Park and Cho were both standing side by side near the ship's wheel on the bridge. Captain Lee was not there at the time, he was in his private cabin. At 8.46 a.m., Sewol was traveling at a speed of 18 knots and at 136 degrees. Park ordered Cho to change course to 140 degrees, and Cho complied. What happened next is a little hazier than I would like. There are conflicting reports about what exactly went down when this was done. But according to Park, after she used the radar to check that Sewol's course was changed, and the new course was set to 140, she ordered Cho again to change the course of the ship to 145. That order was given at 848, but then she realized the ship was heavily listing to starboard, which led the bow to turn to the right. She then gave the order to turn the wheel to port to try to correct this. Immediately after doing that, she then heard Cho say that the wheel wasn't working in a flustered voice, and the ship continued to list. Cho's testimony was not all that different from Park's. He said that the listing began with the order to turn to 140, but Cho says he never received an order to change to 145, only to 140. Because Sewol kept turning towards the right even as he was holding onto the wheel, he made two turns to the left, amounting to a five degree turn. The ship didn't stop its rightward turning, and that resulted in her eventually facing a 145 degree course. Cho said that Park did give him the order to turn in the opposite direction at this point, which he did attempt to do. The courts would come to the conclusion that Cho's steering led the ship to attempt a 15 degree turn for 40 seconds. The court concluded that Cho, who was flustered by the ship turning faster than expected, was attempting to turn to the left when he took Park's order to mean a turn in the opposite direction. Because of this mix-up, he actually turned further to the right instead of left, which caused a very rapid turn to the right on a very overloaded ship. On any other ship, this minor mix-up would not have been fatal. They just would have had to correct the course, but on the Sewol, well, she was not really in a position to make any tight turns. She wound up listing 20 degrees into the water by 8.49, causing cargo to start falling to one side of the ship. The shifting cargo already made the unstable vessel that much worse, and she tilted 10 degrees further into the water. Everything compounded until she was about 45 degrees to the right, and then rotated an additional 22 degrees on the spot for a span of 20 seconds. Because of the cargo shifting, Sewol lost all of her restoring force, which is a force that acts to bring a body back to its equilibrium position and she was listing far enough that it allowed water to flow into the ship through the side door of the cargo loading bay and the car entrance located at the stern. By 8.50 a.m., Sewol was leaning 30 degrees to port. Captain Lee was aware of the situation pretty much immediately, though. He was in his private cabin at the time, but he could tell something was wrong, and he immediately rushed to the bridge to see what was going on. The rest of the crew that were also off-duty also rushed to the bridge to see what they should do next. Around that time, Cho stopped the engines. 
though it's not known if Lee actually ordered that or if he chose to do that on his own. But either way, Cho ordered an evacuation of the engine room through a call to the assistant engineer due to the flooding. Park actually started crying as she was startled by the sudden accident and she wouldn't stop crying until 9.06 a.m. Look, I know you're not the captain and I know you're only human, but you are the third mate on this ship. I'm gonna need you to pull it together for a second. But the engines being shut off proved to be a bit of a mistake because that meant Sewol became unable to change directions and she began to drift sideways. The lights had also gone out after she started listing. By 8.52, it was becoming clear that Sewol was sinking. As that started, the ferry's intercom system started ordering that passengers stay put, alleging that moving was dangerous. That announcement was made by a communication officer, Kang Haisong, who hadn't actually consulted the manual before making that broadcast, really had no idea what he was talking about. And those announcements were set on repeat and continued even when water began flooding passenger compartments. And other crew members corroborated that order, instructing the passengers to stay put. Captain Lee also did this and did not change the order even as he himself was leaving the ship. Oh yes, Captain Lee escaped. The first emergency call wasn't even made by the crew. It was made by one of the high school students Choi Duck Ha. He called the National Emergency Service number and reported that the ship had begun to capsize. Choi was connected to the Mokpo Coast Guard at 8.54 a.m. and was asked to give the latitude and longitude of the ship's location. Three minutes after that, the Mokpo Coast Guard ordered patrol vessel number 123 to be dispatched to the scene, and she was launched at 8.58 a.m. Despite his heroic actions, Choi was one of the ones who did not survive the capsizing of the ship. At 8.55 a.m., Sewol's crew made their first distress call to the Jeju VTS and asked them to notify the KCG. The VTS did call the Jeju Coast Guard, who then called the Mach Po Coast Guard and discovered that a patrol boat had already been dispatched. At 9.01 a.m., a crew member on Sewol called the Incheon branch of Chonghijin to report the situation and the company's head office then called Captain Lee for a report. By 9.06, Jindo VTS were finally informed of the capsizing incident by the Mokpo Coast Guard. Around that same time, the crew began communicating with the VTS, since they were closer to the ship's actual location, and for the next two minutes, VTS alerted two other ships that Sewol was sinking, with one confirming that it did have visual contact with the ship. At 9.07, the ferry's crew confirmed that she was indeed capsizing and requested the help of the KCG. At 9.14, the crew stated that the ship's angle of heel was making evacuation impossible. Around that time, the captain of patrol vessel number 123 was appointed the commander of the scene. And four minutes after that, the crew of Sewol reported to the VTS that the ferry had healed more than 50 degrees to port. At 9.23 a.m., the VTS ordered the crew to inform the passengers to wear their life jackets. The crew replied that the broadcasting equipment was out of order. The VTS told them to, you know, personally order the passengers to wear their life jackets and more clothing. Do your jobs! At 9.25 a.m., the VTS asked Captain Lee to decide quickly whether or not to evacuate the ship, stating that they didn't have enough information to make that decision. Lee inquired about the rescue, and the VTS replied that patrol boats were due to arrive in 10 minutes, and a helicopter in just one. Lee then said that there were too many passengers for the helicopter, and he continued to tell passengers to stay in their cabins, like an idiot. At 9.33 a.m., after confirming that nearby ships had indeed volunteered to help in the rescue operations, the VTS then told all ships to drop lifeboats for passengers. At 9.38, all communications were cut off between the VTS and the Sewol. Three minutes after that, about 150 to 160 passengers and crew all jumped overboard. Prior to that, the captain and the crew had spent most of the time drinking beer and communicating by telephone with both Chonghijin as well as the VTS. Most of the passengers stayed in their cabins as they were told to do, believing the crew had their best interests in mind but while the passengers stayed put, Captain Lee and his crew 
jumped off the ship. Lee, Cho, and the first and second mates are actually the first people to be rescued at all! Which is like, the, the opposite of what we expect to happen generally. And while the ship was capsizing, even as water came in, a lot of the passengers continued staying where they were told to. Most of the students were just kids, and they were told to trust the adults, the experts. So they obeyed the announcements, until it was far too late to escape. Some passengers did disobey, however, and wound up climbing to the top of the ship as she turned over or jumping into the water and wound up being rescued. The ones that wound up being trapped opted to make calls and send text messages, sending farewells to their loved ones. So Wool actually took two and a half hours to sink completely. Her stern was submerged by 1118, and she slipped completely beneath the waves by 103. Rescue efforts actually continued for a few days, as it was thought that some survivors may still be within the hull of the ship, and as they could get access into it, they might be able to save more people. The United States Navy offered their support, and the Japanese Coast Guard also offered to help out. But in the end, 306 people would die in the disaster. 250 were high school students. As of the 13th of December, 2022, technically speaking, the cause of the sinking is still considered undetermined, though the most likely theory has to do with her being savagely overloaded at the time, and the movement of unsecured cargo, and way too much of it, caused her not to be able to restore her balance and flip over. Some more radical theories involve an explosion, a reef collision, or even a collision with a submarine, but none of those are considered particularly likely. And the main thing to most people's minds was, hey, hey, why did you tell the passengers to stay put for so long? Doing that at first may not be that unreasonable, so you don't cause a panic until you figure out what's going on, but once it was clear that you should abandon ship, um, muster stations? Hello? At least get them on deck so they can jump. You have a job here. And you weren't doing it, Lee! And the South Korean authorities definitely agreed. On the 19th of April, Captain Lee was arrested on suspicion of negligence of duty, violation of maritime law, as well as other more minor infringements. This was simply because he had abandoned the ship, with passengers still aboard the ferry, which around the world is considered a serious social taboo, but... South Korean law explicitly requires captains to remain on the ship during a disaster. They literally have a law for this. So, bare minimum, he definitely violated that because he was one of the first ones off. Two other crew members, the helmsman and the third mate, were also arrested on suspicion of negligence and manslaughter. By the 26th of April, 12 further arrests had been made, with the whole crew responsible for navigation being held to face charges. By the 15th of May, Captain Lee, first mate Kang Won Sik, second mate Kim Young Ho, and chief engineer Park Gi Ho were all indicted on charges of homicide through gross negligence, which actually carried a potential death penalty. Eleven other crew members faced much lesser charges of abandoning the ship and ship safety offenses. But not every single member of the crew was a coward who abandoned people when they needed them. Three of them, Park Ji Young, Jong Yun Seon, and Kim Ki Wung, were all credited by survivors with staying aboard the ferry to help passengers escape. And all three of them went down with the sinking vessel. So respect where it's due. The crew weren't the only ones looked into over this. The chief executive of Chong Hee Jin, Kim Han Sik, was also arrested on the 8th of May and faced charges, including causing death by negligence. Four other Chong Hee Jin officials were also taken into custody. The Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries also saw fit to revoke the company's license to operate ferries. By the 11th of November, the Gwangju District Court found Captain Lee guilty of negligence and sentenced him to 36 years imprisonment. 
The judges said that he was clearly not the only person responsible, and they accepted the defense that his negligence did not amount to an intent to kill. The prosecutors couldn't prove that he meant to hurt anyone, necessarily. At least, at first. More on that in a second. Chief Engineer Park Gi-ho was found guilty of murder, and jailed for 30 years. Thirteen other crew members were given jail sentences of up to 20 years imprisonment on charges including abandonment and violating maritime law. Relatives of victims actually didn't like the verdict. As many had been distraught by the loss of their children, they wanted to see the crew pay for what they had done, and public opinion was seriously against them, which was a concern by the courts. They had to preserve the idea of giving these people a fair trial, but... It was hard to do that when the court of public opinion already wanted to basically lynch them. And, you know, I get it. I get it. But there's a process here. Prosecutors decided to appeal the ruling, at least in the case of Captain Lee. And on the 28th of April 2015, he wound up being found guilty of murder. And his sentence was increased to life imprisonment. While those for 14 other crew members were actually reduced to a maximum of 12 years. And Chief Engineer Park Gi-ho's conviction for murder was overturned. Judge Jion Il-ho explained that there was a distinction between the captain and the crew here. Because the crew, well, they were taking orders from the captain. Captain Lee was the one with the main responsibility of the ship. And he could have ordered the crew to, you know, help get the passengers off the ship as they were supposed to do. If they didn't listen to him and mutiny, that's on them. But he didn't even do that. He ordered them to leave the passengers, and he himself was one of the first off. That's not what a captain does. And therefore, he got the brunt of the punishment. There was also significant political and policy ramifications, as many felt that the lax regulatory environment was at least partially to blame for the disaster. It got so bad that on the 27th of April, the Prime Minister, Jung Hong Won, accepted responsibility and announced his resignation. And even among the survivors, there were still people lost even after the disaster. On the 18th of April, the Vice Principal of Dan Wan High School, Kang Min Kyu, who was 52 years old, who did manage to miraculously escape, killed himself by hanging. He had organized the field trip in the first place, that had brought the high school party aboard Sewol, and he had written a two-page note. In it, he says, Surviving alone is too painful when 200 lives are unaccounted for. I take full responsibility. In the note, he also requested that his body be cremated and the ashes scattered over the site, so that I might be a teacher in heaven to those kids whose bodies have not been found. Today, there are several memorials to the disaster, and one can hope that such a horrible thing will never happen again. Lee will spend the rest of his life behind bars, and even some of the families believe that that's too good for him. Though it is worth remembering that it wasn't all his fault. He was a coward and abandoned ship when he shouldn't have. The ship being overloaded probably had nothing to do with him, and she never would have sunk if the regulatory officials had done their jobs and made sure that the ship was safe in the first place. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131 232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, and Zach A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust the Third, Joshua Long, Brian. Jack Carson's Rover Videos, Hayden DeGrow, Master of None, Lord Hawk 444, Alaric Jasper's The Baxter, That Guy With A Beard, Mark Holding, Lock Kraken, Murder Drones Doll, 8 Person 723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Ohio Trucker 1, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hudson 2860, Icerfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Dr. Racer 78, and Matthew Wolf. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.